Welcome everyone to this edition of Rerooted. I'm Francesca Maxime and really grateful to be here with you today. Um, we're recording on April 11th, 2019. And today um, I have a very special guest as I always think my guests are special, um, who really does invite us to do precisely what this podcast um, is about rerouting into our essential nature, rerouting into that which is already there and really sort of um, discovering and connecting and um, allowing um, the natural process of our own organism to unfold so that we can live with uh, greater ease and with balance. Her name is Dr. Pat Ogden. She is a pioneer in somatic psychology and the founder and educational director of the Sensory Motor Psychotherapy Institute, an internationally recognized school specializing in the treatment of trauma. And she is the author of uh, a couple of books, this one more for clinicians, uh, Sensory Motor Psychotherapy Interventions for Trauma and Attachment that she has written with uh, Janina Fisher, one of the folks who teaches sensory motor psychotherapy. And also one that um, I guess, you know, lay people um, perhaps a slightly more, I don't want to say accessible, but a little bit um, easier read, so to speak, Trauma and the Body, A Sensory Motor Approach to Psychotherapy. And again, um, just a beautiful book that um, she wrote with uh, Kakuni Minton and Claire Payne, Pan Payne, and um, and again, just really inviting this sense of ease of well-being in the body. So, Dr. Odgen, Pat, thank you so much for joining us here today on Rerooted. Thank you for having me. Beautiful. Um, just to give uh, folks who aren't familiar with this, uh, this is sort of a mindfulness community that often listens to the Be Here Now Network. Um, you use mindfulness a lot in the way in which you interact with patients and clients. Um, talk to me about why you feel mindfulness. Well, first, what, what you think of when you think of mindfulness. What do you mean when you say mindfulness? And secondly, how do you employ it in your work with folks in order to help them be able to access some of the things that um, might be stuck? I think mindfulness is one of those terms that can apply to many different forms of mindfulness. So it, it can be confusing. Um, we don't teach mindfulness meditation. We don't practice meditation with our clients. I mean, maybe occasionally we, we do, but it's not a part of our program. We work with something that I started calling embedded relational mindfulness after Dan Siegel and I did a workshop on mindfulness and realized halfway through that we were using the term very, very differently because he uses it more in the common uh, way of thinking of mindfulness in terms of meditative practices, and I was using it uh, in a different way. And our use of mindfulness uh, is the way that we get out of the content to help our clients be aware of how they're organizing experience. And this I learned from Ron Kurtz in the 70s, so I, I was taught how to use mindfulness with clients in the 70s. So instead of just talking uh, about issues, um, we want to find out about how experience is organized because the way that we organize experience actually drives the content of our lives. So if, if a client, say, is talking about issues with their childhood, say a, a, a parent who was abusive, um, we will listen to the story as needed, as the client often needs to tell it. But the crux of the work is, has to do with mindfulness, with statements like, so what do you notice right now as you're talking about this abuse? And we're looking for body sensation, movements and movement impulses, uh, five sense perceptions, the internally generated images, sounds, tastes, smells, uh, emotions, and cognitions. So it's not conversation. And I, I love focusing on the organization of experience because it's very concrete, it's very present moment, it has to be studied through mindfulness. Um, and the embedded relational part of the mindfulness is the client kind of takes us by the hand into their internal world 
because they're, they're reporting to us. Like a client might say, well, my body's tightening up and I feel this fear and I have this image of my father's face. So you are right there with them in that present moment uh, in a relational mindfulness uh, uh, context. Um, and it, it really gets at the meta level. Um, and our, our work is about discovering how experience is organized and changing those habits that are limiting a client's richness of, of experience, richness of life. Right, beautiful. Yeah, I, um, you know, say sort of the shift from surviving to thriving, you know, sort of that shift from um, being constricted to being more uh, able to be able to be expansive, not that we live in the expanse 24 seven, because that would be equally impossible. Um, but that we are able to have that fluidity and flexibility in much the same way that um, I would assume that in your career as a former dancer, you, you know, would would do so with the body in that way. Um, yeah. Yeah, I started studying dance as a child because I'm over six feet tall and my mom was an artist and she said, well, if you're going to be tall, you're going to be graceful. So she put me in dance class. I was too tall to, at that time in the 50s and 60s to be a professional dancer, but I have danced most of my life. Uh, and I can still remember, I think I was seven when my teacher was talking about poise in the body and she was demonstrating this you know, length in the spine, and I just got it immediately. And I felt as a child how that shifts everything when you have this, she called it poise, as opposed to just slumping, you know, yes. posture. Or something. Yes, yes, yes. And, 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 and as someone who um, also received dance training as a young child, although I did not pursue it to the degree that you did, um, it was very intentional on my mom's part to sort of expose me to that and um, standing tall, so to speak, knowing what it's like to be in a room, knowing what it's like to have that kind of presence and poise, as you say, um, that nice long spine, relaxed and alert, um, both, right? We're neither hypervigilant nor collapsed, that we can just sort of be here, but be fully here. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's, a, it's, it's interesting because uh, the embodied cognition field now, they're doing a lot of research on on the body and posture and movement. And uh, a Norwegian researcher, Dijkstra is her name, uh, she discovered that if you take on a certain posture, like a slump posture like this, it will bring forward the memories of when that posture was operational. Um, so when you think how important that is for clients uh, to shift those out of alignment postures so that the, those abusive or problematic memories are not constantly being triggered. And that's the organization of experience. Yeah, I, I love that. So let's play with that a little bit, if you don't mind. So just that slumping posture, I'm thinking um, of someone I know who tends to orient in that way um, based on past um, you know, developmental traumas and, um, and is an adult and fully functioning now, but also has this piece that would like to be unburdened, so to speak. And um, that organization of experience, if you're down here like this with your body sort of slumped over, shoulders forward, head down a little bit more like that. And this is a um, sort of a habit pattern, if you will, from this um, adaptive response early on. How would you, in this relational mindfulness way or in this way of sensory motor psychotherapy, work with the client or a patient to help um, shift that? That's a very complex question. <laughs> <laughs> it, it really depends on the, the client's window of tolerance, like how much integrative capacity they have. Um, so with, with some clients, for example, who are not at risk, but maybe have a narrower window of tolerance who couldn't uh, uh, integrate going into that posture and exploring the pain of it, I might just resource them. Like I, I had a client recently who was very depressed and he, it was a consultation and he, his posture was just slumped like this, head in, head in his hands, and he couldn't think clearly. So that's the thing, when you're, when you're like this, he was just ruminating and he felt really sad and teary. And I wanted to give him, help him find a resource to come out of that. So I asked him to push his feet in the floor and, and lengthen his spine. 
to, to shift that habit of, of organizing. Now, I would call that a resource that then he could use in his life. He was kind of amazed because he could think more clearly. So his thoughts changed, his emotions changed, of course, because your whole organization of experience changes when your procedural learning in the body changes. But with another man, for example, who was also depressed, but he, he didn't have severe trauma, um, and we were able to use that slumped posture to exaggerate it slightly to go back into those childhood memories and process the pain and the beliefs that he learned at that time. And then his posture spontaneously started to shift. So one is resourcing and the other is processing the issues. And, and they're both, I think, critical elements of any psychotherapy. Beautiful. And the piece about resourcing, you may move from the resourcing to the processing eventually, right? Yes. But yeah. over time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, as a client becomes more stabilized and wi can widen their window of tolerance so they can actually tolerate and integrate more emotions, more stimuli from the inside and the outside, then we can, we can go to phase two treatment of resolving those memories. Uh-huh, beautiful, yeah. I, I'm thinking of one client who, um, that I have, um, that I've worked with who essentially um, does do the rumination and um, is more um, having a hard time with uh, moving beyond thinking that the past um, choices in the past made differently would have made for a better today. Mm -hmm. And that the today is, uh, that's here is, is you know, fraught with issues, but it's a habit pattern, habit pattern of the mind to go, to go back to this. And when we touch into doing some of the work that you've talked about, which is more the, well, what was it like when you were little or what was it like? And what was mm, that child needing at the time? And those kinds of things, the sadness always comes up. And the idea about um, being with um, that little one and having the adult, uh, who's here now in the room with me experiencing what it's like to be in this sort of, I, dare I say, relational mindfulness field um, with me and some sort of resonance uh, can begin to touch into it, but the sadness and the grief um, sort of do the push away. And then it goes back to the thinking. And I'm just, you know, the thinking meaning relying on the left brain as opposed to sort of allowing those limbic right brain um, emotional memories to kind of arise and be held uh, in a safe way today. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if I were working with that person, um, I think one of the things I would look for is how the body participates in the ruminating, because it will. The body participates in every single action we make, every thought, there's a physical component. Uh, and I, I would also want to frame that as a survival defense. You know, it is a, a survival, well not, I'm sorry, not a defense, a survival resource, uh, not a defense. Um, because she learned to just, mull and ruminate to, to stay away from uh, whatever. And so I'd want to find out the function of that. Right. Yeah, I love that. And, and, and we do um, explore that a little bit in a titrated way, as we say, which for those who may not understand or know or be familiar with these words, titration, pendulation, window of tolerance, and these kinds of things, we're sort of talking about bringing the nervous system back into, um, I think Dan Siegel uses the term range of resilience, or, or there, there are various terms around, um, maybe his is the window of tolerance, actually, I don't know, but it is, yeah, that one's his, um, and that that's basically where we feel okay, like we're, we're, we're able to meet what is presented to us in a way that is responsive, but not necessarily reactive in a way that is um, helpful. So in that way, when you're looking at a client, when you're looking at a person, even if someone you're out in public and you notice, what are you tracking or noticing about someone's posture, about the way that they um, use their hands, the way that they hold their head, their spine? Because a lot of what you're doing in your sensory motor psychotherapy is uh, observation in that way, is it not? Well, yeah. Yeah, we, I have been reading bodies, I think, my whole life, and I, I love it. 
in the 70s, Ron Kurtz and I used to just walk down to the Boulder Mall and sit on the bench and just watch people walk by and talk about all the differences because everybody has their own signature patterns of movement and expression. And I, I think of it in, in different ways. One is the alignment of the body. Um, we would call it peace with gravity. So if, if the body is aligned with gravity, there's, there's kind of like a line that goes up through your, your joints and your body is not rigid, but um, positioned in relationship with gravity so that gravity not only holds you to the earth, but it also lifts you up. It's ergonomically balanced in that way. So we look, and, and then that creates the axis around which we can you know, move. Uh, if our body is slumped, that axis doesn't have the flexibility and it constrains our, our range of motion and our movement. So I, I look at that alignment, I look at the uh, 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 movement vocabulary. Pierre Genet in the 1800s, he talked about look for familiar movements in your clients and unfamiliar movements, and that is a great way to, and simple too, to analyze movement. Uh, is a client like I had one client who was very familiar with, with this kind of motion, but reaching out was super uncomfortable for her. And that says everything because there was nobody there to reach to as a child. Right, and just for those who are only listening and aren't watching the video, that was a push away, hands up movement as opposed to a open palm, um, inviting in uh, kind of movement. Mm -hmm. And so what happens in the body? Um, when you see someone unable to um, do just what you said, that, that, that they can do perhaps more easily one or the other. Um, for example, uh, one of my clients, uh, doing, just doing this brings tears. Uh -huh. um, and I'm pushing my hands up away. Um, and so uh, how, do we, how does that begin to tell us some of what the body has learned in a survival adaptive way and also what it might need now to come back more into balance and freedom? Well, we will uh, uh, abandon or distort natural movements when those movements have not produced the desirable outcome. For many tra traumatized clients, pushing away or fighting back made the abuse worse. Um, so this is where the organization of experience comes in. It, 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 like when your client pushes away and tears come, there's emotions there. I'm sure there's thoughts that go with it. There's memories that go with it. So we can't uh, uh, have, there's no one size fits all about what they would need. No. Oh, I just taught a workshop on shame this last weekend and uh, people, the natural instinct is to want some sort of formula. There's some sort of, when this happens, you do this. What, way too complex for that. The human condition is so complicated. Uh, if we're studying the organization of experience, we are not making those decisions. We are helping a client through embedded relational mindfulness find their answers from inside themselves. Um, so it's not a matter of us thinking about what's needed. It's a matter of staying with the organization of experience to get enough of the right kind of information from inside and then the system spontaneously will change. And that is revolutionary to many psychotherapists. I, I agree with you and I, and I love that. And, I'm, and it's just, again, I, I'll, I, I won't share any more about my folks, but you know, the, one of my clients even just yesterday um, was saying that she was feeling very burdened and had a lot um, of um, uh, tasks that she felt she needed to do, not only for herself, but for others. Mm -hmm. And um, that, that it felt like it was a cloak or a big heavy kind of a, a cloak or coat. And um, somehow when we sort of went through this process of guiding and holding and sort of reflecting and being with or, you know, um, then she said, I just said, what are you noticing now? What's happening now? And she did this movement. Oh, it's like a zipper has been opened and I'm stepping through and the back coat is back there. And I said, well, where's the conflict you were talking about? So oh, it's back there. And I said, what's the quality of this? What are you noticing here now? And she said, Oh, it's like new skin. Mm -hmm. It's soft and delicate, mm -hmm. and it needs to have me take care of it. 
oh. which I thought was so beautiful. Yeah, that's lovely. Yeah. Um, and so in a way, that was completely her. That was not me. Yeah. Well, it should be completely the client. The job of the, of the therapist is to create a, a context so that the client's own internal wisdom can come forward and they can transform ever about the therapist doing something for or to the client, in my opinion. Right. No, I, I agree. So tell me how you work with folks when they do come in with um, either that hyper arousal, their nervous system is sort of hyper activated um, versus kind of what we were talking about earlier, which is sort of that more hypo arousal when they're a little bit more collapsed. Um, so I would say maybe it's the anxiety uh, end versus more depression end, but it could be anything. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, if if the client uh, is in need of resources, of stabilization, um, we'll work with resources. We, we have, in, in the book that you held up on sensory motor psychotherapy, there's whole chapters of, of resources. That book, just for the listener, has chapters in there written for the client that are written to be very accessible. Um, so, um, uh, I take I take that back. My apologies. <laughs> different skills, and I also want to say that uh, the worksheets in the book can be uh, uh, obtained from the Sensory Motor Psychotherapy Institute as a PDF, so that they're easy to to Xerox. There are tons of worksheets for clients. Beautiful. Um, um, if if a client is at the edge of the window or or over the window and needs resources, that's what I'll look at first to fulfill the, the phase one treatment goals of stabilization. So if they're hyper aroused, again, it's individual, clients gravitate and can make use of different resources, whether it's breath. Many, many clients like to work with breath. However, there's a lot of caveats about that because if you have a traumatized client whose diaphragm is very tight anyway, to even suggest a deep breath can increase the anxiety. Or if the uh, deep breath, which stimulates the dorsal vagal system, causes arousal to drop in such a way uh, that, cup, that kind of velcros on to a feigned death response, which is common uh, defensive response for many traumatized people, that can also be counter therapeutic. So there is no one size fits all. It might be grounding, it might be rocking, it might be self-touch. It's highly, highly individual to the client. So sometimes it requires a little experimentation. For hypoarousal, which is an increase in dorsal vagal tone, it is a pain a version of a feigned death response, and Im which is an immobilizing response, any kind of movement. Um, so all, I remember one client, as soon as she would come in and sit down, her arousal would just drop. Sometimes she couldn't speak. So we, uh, I would meet her at the door and we would start out just going for a walk and talking mm -hmm. because that was a resource that mitigated that, that hypoarousal. But I also want to say that uh, if a client has sufficient integrative capacity and they're at the edge of that window of tolerance, because you see, if, if, if this is a window and I'm holding my hands parallel so that there's a space in, in between, if, and if arousal is within that window of tolerance, which is actually a term coined by Dan Siegel in his 1999 book, if arousal is within that window, we can, like you said, we can integrate what's happening within us, and also information and stimuli from the outside. <clears throat> However, the goal of therapy is to help widen that window of tolerance, not just to always bring arousal back in. So if a client has enough integrative capacity to tolerate working on the edge of that window of tolerance, say a client who's anxious, um, I might want to say, okay, let's explore the anxiety. Let's just stay right with it and see what you can discover. What thoughts, uh, physical impulses, sensations go with it. And I'll often tell, uh, say to a client, you know, if it's too much, tell me. And so we, we, we work very re, uh, collaboratively. Yeah, I love that because it was even just yesterday, I think I was listening to um, 
uh, a podcast of one of the um, mindfulness teachers on this network, Joseph Goldstein, and he was talking about virya, the Pali word for, um, it could be energy or courage or sort of, um, I guess my mom would even call it stick to That's a word that my mom, you know, invented. <laughs> um, and, and, and just sort of this idea of, of kind of making a commitment to something and staying with it and staying curious about it and seeing, you know, where it might lead you. So that growing edge, as you're talking about in terms of the window. Now in a, in a meditation setting, for example, um, the encouragement might be, well, you know, um, what is it like if maybe you didn't have the evening meal at this retreat or something, or, you know, in the, you know, what, what would that be like? Or what, what might it be like if you sat for an extra 10 minutes in your meditation, as opposed to getting up after 60 minutes or whatever it is, and just to see and explore that. Um, however, in those settings, they tend to be, although sometimes in groups, um, more, uh, solo experiences. Whereas in this kind of experience, you're, you're inviting folks to, um, sort of explore what's happening in the body because obviously we know with mindfulness it's not just the mind it's the heart mind it's the body also um, to do it in a relational capacity and how does that based on attachment based on um, the ways in which we develop how does that I want to say change the game a little bit or a lot oh well, it does change the game a lot because uh, <clears throat> mindfulness as we know is very present moment um, we're, we are very specific about mindfulness. Uh, what we're looking for is what we call the five core organizers of experience, which make up our, our daily waking experience. Sensation, movement, five sense perception, uh, emotion, and thought. And we're, we're looking for a response in mindfulness. Like uh, uh, when clients are studying being mindful of their organization experience, they're noticing those elements. So they're not responding with conversation. They're noticing, they're saying, okay, I'm starting to feel sad. I'm having this thought that pops up of, it's my fault, my body's getting tight, there's a sensation of tingling, I have this smell that is coming up or this taste or this image. So it's very precise, it is not a conversation. There's a way then that the, the therapist and the client are deeply sharing this relational experience. And I, that alone is profound for a client. It's rare in our lives that we have someone attend to our present moment experience in that way, if ever. Um, and, and because the client is telling us what is happening inside as it's happening, we are right there with them, with that experience. And I, I think in, in my work, what really makes that, uh, um, I don't like the word effective, I guess meaningful, are the, the umbrella principles that guide everything we do in sensory motor psychotherapy. And those are principles based in Eastern philosophy uh, um, of, Organicity. I don't know if I should talk about them, but I I, yeah, no, please do, and because I'm I'm actually interested in how I think really trauma work, especially, but also um, yeah, this healing work. It's sacred work, and um, and I, in my opinion, it's spiritual work. So please yeah, do. Spiritual work. I, I feel the same way, and and I think therapists don't usually consider the philosophical spiritual principles that form the the context that you work in, it's the waters that we swim in. Um, and Ron, Ron Kurtz and I used to talk about this in the 70s, and he, he was very in, into these, these principles, and I've added to it since then. But there, we've, we have six now. Uh, there's organicity, which is a term borrowed from Gregory Bateson, that just means that every living system has its inner wisdom. Uh, that, that in and our job becomes helping a client find that intelligence. Now, it's not a top-down authoritative model. Um, another principle is nonviolence, which I think of as the, the manifestation of, of organicity. Because if, if, a, if, a, if a person has the answers within them, there's no need to push or force or use paradoxical interventions. That pathway to healing is already there. We don't have to be violent. Um, uh, unity is another one, which is means that we are really in it together. Um, um, I don't have secrets for my clients. 
if I have a question or I'm thinking about it, I'll just share it with them. Um, we're, we're very much co-creating the session together. Uh, mind, body, spirit, holism uh, is another one that uh, is so obvious to me that mind, body, and spirit are just different sides of the same coin. And in this lifetime, anyway, they're all, it's all manifesting through the body. And so that's why the body is like a fundamental anchor in sense of things like Yeah. Go ahead. Well, the mindfulness is, is also a, another principle. And, I, and in the last few years, I've, I've been distinguishing between presence and mindfulness. So I, I think of that kind of on a continuum. Because my students are always saying to me, you must be so mindful when you're working. And I'm like, I'm not mindful at all. Uh, because mm -hmm. we're in this bubble and things are just coming through. I'm not noticing my own experience unless it pops up and draws my attention. So uh, the presence I think of as a, a more of a unified state. Where mindfulness, there's a dual state. There's the watcher and that which is watched. So I want to help students distinguish uh, between those two. And then I just added a principle that I'm calling relational alchemy because I needed, I needed a principle that described the unique uh, dance in any particular relational experience. Um, so if I'm working with a client, it would be a very different dance than if you're working with a client. Um, and relational alchemy, it speaks to that alchemical, mysterious, uh, uh, element of when two systems, two living systems come together. And it also helps us uh, have a way to explain therapeutic enactments from a progressive evolutionary standpoint. Yeah, I, I love that, that, that there is something happening in this relational field, um, whether you want to call it an energetic field, a vibrational field, a, a heart heart connection field, <laughs> um, right. that, there's, that there's something happening there. Um, and, you know, uh, again, I always quote my mom, but she always talks about how people who've been married for a really long time, you know, whether or not their marriage was perfect or not or whatever, but if you've been living together with somebody for 60 years, that, you know, she's like, there's something in the air, you know, that when one dies, you know, that, 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 that there's something that is missing, you know, not just a broken heart necessarily, but that there's something else happening. Um, she's a doctor, so I don't know. <laughs> um, and, and, and I saw that recently with um, a journalist that you may be familiar with, Soledad O'Brien. Um, I think her, her, her dad passed and her mom passed within three months of one another. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, with, go ahead. Well, well, yeah, I think, I mean, of course, there, that, I think that has to do with the unity principle and, and relational alchemy. I want to emphasize this aspect of relational alchemy because it's the principle that really honors a two-person therapy instead of a one-and-a-half-person therapy, which is kind of what I learned. One-and-a-half was the, the client brings their full self, the therapist just brings their loving, kindness, expansive, wonderful self. Hmm. That's not human. That's not even possible. Uh, but in the humanistic tradition that I was raised in, I was taught to be sure to put any part of me that wasn't you know, aligned with that con loving context aside. And relational al alchemy challenges that because when our implicit self interacts with our client's implicit self, we often get into a therapeutic enactment and we get really stuck. And there is so much intelligence and wisdom in that. Uh, it's like a magical coming together of these two unhealed aspects that when relationally negotiated, uh, leads to a, a much more profound change for the client and, so, and also often for the therapist. Yeah. I was just going to say, if we could use an example um, of that, for example, um, I don't know if anything comes to mind for you, and some folks may not be familiar with the term enactments, but essentially yeah. that means when something within the therapist um, would be activated, for lack of a better term, or me, you can yes. describe it. And, it, you know, our implicit right brain self is always activated, uh, sometimes for the 
immediate uh, expansive growth that we just love with our clients. When you talked about your client having that fresh skin, I'm sure that that really touched you. And we live for those moments. Right. Um, <clears throat> I lost my train of thought. <laughs> well, just an example on what the um, relational aspect, alchemy of uh, what that might look like. Um, you know, yeah. Yeah. Okay. I can give an example um, of, of my own. I, I worked with a client who had a very intrusive mother um, uh, and she, rem she was remembering her childhood. Her body was just getting tighter and tighter and tighter. And I was on the explicit journey of therapy. I was seeing that tension as a precursor to action. Uh, which it is, tension is a precursor to action. So I was trying to help her find the movement uh, within that tension, and we were not getting anywhere. She was getting more and more frozen. Um, and at one point, I, I, uh, she had spontaneously closed her eyes, and at one point, I, I leaned forward, and I asked her to open her eyes and look at me, and because we had a good relationship, and see if that changed anything. She just got tighter. Um, and mm -hmm. as I, well, thought about this as an enactment, uh, it was so clear to me that with my childhood, my father was killed in an accident when I was three. And my mother, I think, was really grieving for, for years. And uh, she was just a little, she was kind of withdrawn. And as a child, I was always trying to reach her. I was always trying to pull her out to come and connect with me. And I could feel that in the session, like I was trying to pull my client out to come and connect with me. So she experienced me as invasive. And I experienced her as withdrawn. Mm. Um, what shifted it uh, was, I mean, I was desperate for anything <laughs> at that point. And, you know, and, and things just come through you as a, as a therapist. Um, nothing I was doing was, was helping her unfreeze. And so I, I said, well, what happens if I close my eyes? And she immediately started to relax. And so then I moved my chair back and back and back and she got more and more relaxed and we were laughing and it was just fabulous. And through that negotiated therapeutic enactment uh, of right brain to right brain, implicit self communication, a, a, a bigger transformation was achieved. Uh, than would have happened if I had realized her need for space at the very beginning, because we got really stuck together. Mm. And as I moved back, she got the distance she wanted, and I got the connection I wanted. So for those little kids inside of us, both of us uh, had the sense of our, that our needs were legitimized and could and were met in that moment between us. Wow, that's so beautiful. So that's a negotiated, a relationally negotiated enactment. But sometimes, you know, these enactments, they can go on for, for weeks. So. Yeah, the, the enactment being sort of this replay of like, oh, you know, we're getting activated or triggered as a, as a practitioner of some kind with the um, uh, student, if you will, and that there's this um, mm, stuckness that can happen um, when we're not as self-aware as you were of, um, you know, perhaps inviting it in the sense of, okay, maybe I need to change it up and try something else, like closing my eyes and see if that yeah. would help. But what I love about that is you're getting your needs met. You're doing something different that would be counterintuitive to what you had learned as an adaptive strategy as a kid to try and pull your mother out. Yeah. And that in, in creating that space, you actually fostered more connection and you also kept your differentiation. So you, you, you built up the strength of relationship while at the same time um, honoring your individuality or your uniqueness and, and all of that. But it was through your each unique pieces that the healing was taking place as they were coming together. Yes, and it, it was relationally negotiated. You know, it, it, that's the relational alchemy. Um, yeah. We got, we got through it together. And you know, there's magic. Uh, I, I think we're all striving for higher levels of organization and, and relational alchemy will bring together those unhealed parts of therapist and client and they'll get, you know, just stuck and entwined. But if you 
stumble along and hang in, as Philip Bromberg says, and don't leave. You can, you can work it out relationally. Well, I love what you're saying because, um, you know, a couple of folks that I know have said things like this, like, you know, we're, we're wounded in relationship, we're healed in relationship. And yet there's a lot of folks who, because of the wounding or neglect early on, um, uh, auto-regulate, self-regulate to such a degree that, um, you know, leaning on someone else is so painful um, that it becomes uh, something that would be, be terrifying, mm -hmm. if you will. And, and when I say lean on, I, I, I guess I should rephrase that. Um, believing that somebody one might be there for you to meet your needs and be attuned in the way that, that you would hope or, or want. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm just sort of societally, I sort of see some of this um, sort of structurally in terms of the, uh, you know, go West young man and, you know, meritocracy and let's do our, our culture of individualism as opposed to uh, sort of more of a collective um, working together. How do you see this playing out on a broader scale? Well, I definitely uh, see it playing out in terms of oppression privilege dynamics throughout the world. Uh, and uh, uh, we're working as an institute uh, pretty steadily to become an anti-racist, anti-oppression school, which we are not. Uh, our heritage is Eurocentric and inherent in Eurocentrism is uh, oppression. Um, so we're, I mean, there's a huge discrepancy and huge problems that come from privilege oppression dynamics. And I think as a, as a person of privilege, as a white uh, woman, um, and the only thing that would give me more privilege is if I were male, right? I have to uh, take that <clears throat> step to look at what it means to be white and what privilege really means because uh, most, most of us don't understand white privilege. I didn't understand it. And whenever there's privilege, somebody else loses. And how to work with that within our side of ourselves, within our clients, within our schools and our institutes is really challenging. Yeah, beautiful. I, go ahead. Well, and how, and how to reach communities that we have not um, we have not yet really reached lower socioeconomic status communities, communities of, of uh, people of color. This was really tough for me because I, uh, half my family is black and, and I worked in the inner city in the 60s uh, and I taught at the first integrated schools. I worked in all black communities. I, you know, participated in civil rights marches and I thought I had it handled. And, I realized I, years ago, I didn't have a clue about what it means to be white uh, uh, and the privilege afforded to me through no merit of my own. And the, you know, that you use the term meritocracy. Well, that is, uh, um, that it doesn't address the, the, the privilege and power uh, dynamics that lead to oppression. And I so appreciate everything that you're sharing um, on multiple levels and um, the meritocracy being a piece of patriarchy for me. Um, patriarchy being the system of um, ranking and not linking. Patriarchy being the system of um, superiority, which requires that something is less than um, than me. And also is very untenable and difficult to sustain because how can we always be at the top of anything, uh, the most superior of, of anything, uh, uh, whatever that means. And yet that's what's kind of being held and that there's a certain um, uh, race, there's a certain um, way, maybe a certain gender, sexual orientation, you know, uh, all of these things that are quote unquote right and the other ones that quote unquote are wrong or less than or whatever it is in that system that there are so many ways in which um, that's just being torn apart in, in so many ways today that, that weren't perhaps um, fully fleshed out 40 years ago or 50 years ago uh, and we're still in process around that. So I'm curious what it was for you, if you want to share, if you don't want to share it um, and don't want to put you on the spot either, what it was when you say, well, I didn't really know, 
you know, I, I was doing this work, half my family's black, I was on the marches, I, I knew I was a white woman, but, you know, what was your point of, quote unquote, awakening around that? I think what I, what I didn't understand is white identity construction. Uh, I didn't understand all the advantages I have solely due to the color of my skin. Um, <clears throat> and I didn't under, I just, it wasn't conscious for me. Um, it's becoming more and more conscious and all the ways that it's, that it manifests is coming, becoming more and more conscious. We're, we're very focused as a school at looking at um, um, the microaggressions that we perpetuate in so many ways uh, and it's very complex um, and looking at how we can hold that uh, over a year ago i started a think tank with some people of color in our school uh, we meet um you know two three times a month to address these issues and it's a wonderful context uh for me because i'm called on my white privilege all the time uh, mm -hmm. And I'm much more aware of my power and influence and much more aware of the, the Eurocentric system I've, I'm steeped in. For example, we're struggling right now to find a child development theory that is more uh, uh, multiculturally encompassing than a Eurocentric theory that honors differentiation and autonomy and individualism and all these things. That, that's not true in indigenous cultures. So, and we, 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 haven't even found, we haven't even found a theory that expresses that uh, 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 in, in a way that, that we've settled on it yet. So all these implicit ways that we live out our whiteness um, um, and becoming aware of that and struggling then with, with action. Because once you have that awareness, you've got to take some action. Yeah, I, I again, just want to really underscore how much I appreciate you sharing that. What you're naming um, in terms of naming whiteness and, and, and really just that it is a process of, um, of awakening, of waking to this, of exploring, of doing the work, of um, sort of being in the trenches, understanding, you know, these are the conversations that are, uh, as one of my friends, Lama Rada Owens and Reverend Angel Kyoto Williams talk about, they're messy conversations. You know, yeah. they're, they're some, or they can be, they don't have to be. Yeah, but, they, are messy. <laughs> they are almost inherently messy. They are. And that having a capacity to self-regulate or to be in a more expanded will it window of tolerance, I feel um, in my own life as I've begun to do some of this work, then helps me be more present for um, what can be messy or uncomfortable, but not intolerable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I think you're right about that window of tolerance. And, you know, in, in the multicultural community, there's, there's a lot of talk about the stages of that, like, First, it has to be personal awareness because we grew up in a racist society. We did. We think of television and how people of color were portrayed when I was growing up. It was in demeaning roles. So there's no way to deny that we have implicit relational bias, uh, uh, implicit bias towards you know, marginalized groups. And once we realize that, with that awareness, then then we've got to acquire knowledge. We've got to learn about it, uh, and uh, and then comes the skill. I think a lot of us, and I think that that's what I meant too. In the in the sixties, I was applying skill, but I didn't have. I didn't think I was racist. Half my friends were black. Blah blah blah. I was still racist, um, and I didn't have the, the awareness or the knowledge. And now I'm, I'm really working to get the awareness and the knowledge, and it's changing my actions. Beautiful. And changing your actions in the way like meeting with these folks you're talking about. And well, yes, and, and just the realization, like if I am like um, a student wrote me from years ago uh, about uh, a situation in a training, like four or five years ago, where she was, a person, she was a person of color where she felt dismissed um, because I had defended one of my white trainers. And my, my impulse from years ago, I would have said, well, you know, that wasn't my intention. I didn't mean it that way. 
But with the knowledge and the understanding now as a person of color of what it took to even tell me this as a white person and to say, oh, I didn't mean it that way is like the worst thing a, a person of privilege can say. You know, so then I respond very differently. Uh, tell me more. You know, I want to hear. It must have felt like I dismissed you, which is probably the story of your life. Um, so it's a much bigger context that then I can respond to in a, a, a way that implicitly recognizes that bigger picture of oppression privilege dynamics. I, I so appreciate that because it was only a couple of years ago that I was on a retreat and um, teacher, white skin, uh, you know, teacher, um, when I had said, you know, this is such a beautiful uh, uh, retreat and, and such a beautiful uh, gathering, a couple hundred people, you know, really, um, and, and I just said it would be nice if there were more people of color um, that were also here in the room. And it wasn't said in a way uh, that was aggressive. Um, it was just noting, uh, and uh, I got the the finger point, which was, well, you're angry, you know, uh, right. you need to do more uh, loving kindness oh. meditation, oh. and I was like, wow, um, okay, so there's that. Uh huh. Yeah, there's that. <laughs> so I, I don't, you know, in, in terms of this issue, I really think it's about self awareness and knowledge. Mm -hmm. Like, I used to say those same things, gee, I wish we could have more people of color in our trainings, you know, but I wasn't really looking at why we don't. Of course we don't. It's a Eurocentric model. Um, and I, I went to a multicultural conference this uh, uh, um, fall with she Shelley Harrell and other people that I, I've uh, grown to know. And, and they, they did a presentation on mindfulness, for example, and it really elucidated why we don't have more people of color in our organization, because mindfulness has a whole different twist uh, if you're a person of color. So looking, looking, more at not, looking more at ourselves and why, we are, why we're not creating this welcoming environment to marginalized communities and how we can shift that through our own awareness of our own implicit bias and, and our own inherent racism, et cetera. Well, Pat, I mean, really, um, you went there and I have to give you a, 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 an, a real um, bow of respect and appreciation for you um, willing to have this conversation because I think, frankly, um, with the exception of people of color, uh, you may be the first white skin privileged person that I've had uh, this um, personal of a level of conversation about, um, and also um, with a nod to your uh, work as a uh, founder of, uh, you know, your, your work and, and the trainings that you do. Um, is there any, for example, uh, and I'll, because we're closing shortly, we're winding down, time is short. Um, I know for me, I have had to do a lot of work myself as a multiracial um, but yet light-skinned privileged woman who had not examined this issue of what it meant to be um, highly privileged in many ways until the invitation was put before me a few years ago and I started to look at it. And it was painful for a while. And, and I can't say that it's simple or easy, but of course, none of these realizations about the history of this country or whatever are really. Um, but after I started to do that, then I could start doing, as you say, meeting people in a different way, yeah. seeing things that were just like, I can't go back to not seeing. Yeah, yeah, right, exactly. And the work that, um, you know, that has been done in my case is, you know, like White Awake is a, is a class, um, Patty Dye offers classes, um, you know, you mentioned um, your friend who's actually going to be on this podcast, Shelly Harrell, um, yeah. Resna. Resma Manicum, I just interviewed also. Yeah. And, um, you know, I'll be talking to more people, uh, Percy Ballard, uh, who does implicit bias work, uh, in the coming months to, to really kind of dig into this and sort of say, what are the things that we don't know so we can move forward with this embodied sense of um, examining our own privilege and biases and then also extending the hand open to uh, other folks and listening, really, um, for what they have to say. 
I think that the one of the problems is is that as a person of privilege, I'm not affected by these issues. So it, it's not in my face every day. It's in it's in my nephew's face every single day. People of color deal with this constantly, uh, especially in communities like ours that are primarily white. Um, so it takes. I I, I think it was. God, I'm probably going to get the name wrong, but I think it was Alice, Alan, Alan Johnson who wrote a, a book uh, on these issues. And he said that if there's anything to be proud of as a white person in terms of privilege, it is how we hold these dynamics of an issue we, not, we did not create. We didn't have slavery, et cetera, but yet we are a part of, and it lives in us, this implicit bias. And, and so I think as, as a person of privilege, as people of privilege, we have to take that initiative to educate ourselves. Uh, and it, it requires an extra inner sense of responsibility for these issues, realizing that we are not faced with them every day, but our communities are, you know, our world is. And, and because we have the power and the privilege, we have a lot of responsibility to go that extra mile. Yeah. Dr. Pat Ogden, um, I really don't think there's anything else that I can say other than such a deep bow of gratitude for all of what you've shared here today, um, especially um, the last half of our conversation around this issue. Uh, of privilege, which I, I find uh, incredibly rich and appreciate you. Is there anything else that you would like to say or add about our conversation or about your work in general or about where people can find you? Um, well, people can find the Institute online at sensorymotor.org. We do trainings all over the world. Um, so maybe we'll see some of your listeners in a training. Um, I don't know that I have much else to say. I think uh, your listeners are probably on the path and I hope that everyone will take steps to address the privilege oppression issues. And, and also, I, people often say, well, how can I start to learn about sensory motor psychotherapy? And what I, what I usually say is get curious about bodies. Like, look at bodies, watch people walk and look at all the differences, just get curious. Because that's really the best education you can have. I love that. Staying curious. Yeah. Dr. Pat Ogden, Sensory Motor Psychotherapy, Trauma in the Body. Um, you can find her uh, and the Institute online at sensorymotor.org. Yes. Okay. All right. Thank you so much for being with us today here on Rerooted. So appreciate your time and, um, and your beautiful energy. Thank you too. It was a pleasure.